All right, good afternoon, APHA. Hey, that was pretty good. I am so grateful to be here for a fourth year uh, for a live taping of our podcast, America to Second. My name is Dr. Abdul Al Sayed. I've been hosting the show now for about five years. And this show is intended to, to go beyond the headlines on the issues that so many of us are thinking about every single day. And the show was meant to be a limited run series of 10 episodes in 2019. And uh, the first episode came out in September, went 10 episodes, we wrapped in November. And then we all know what happened. And that's when the show became a weekly show, initially focused on the COVID pandemic, and then after that, thinking more broadly about all of the issues that created the subtext, the consequence, the circumstance of this pandemic. Now, if you all didn't know, there's kind of an important election happening soon. And I say this as somebody who's from the great state of Michigan. Anybody else from Michigan here? There it is. Who here is from the Michiganders, actually all of us, sick and tired of hearing those stupid election commercials, huh? Like, I'm not a huge pharma fan, like anybody who listens to the show knows that, but I've actually found myself hankering for like a, a, a good pharma ad. But here's the interesting thing about it. As the two parties duke it out, we're hearing a lot about inflation. We're hearing a lot about the border. We're hearing a lot about Arnold Palmer. But you know what we're not hearing a lot about? We're not hearing a lot about public health. We're not hearing a lot about healthcare. And it's kind of odd, because in 2016 and 2020, healthcare was among the most important topics as pollsters polled. And it's receded in a way. But that's weird because so much of what we understand about 2024 has its roots in the worst pandemic to befall the world in nearly a century. You'd think that after a pandemic that took a million American lives, tens of millions globally, you'd think that after a pandemic that set up the inflation that we've lived through over the last several years, you'd think that in a country where nearly 10 million people go without health care every single day, that maybe, just maybe, this would be a topic that we want to talk about. But then we have to ask, why are we not? What is it about health care or public health that makes it a political non-starter for both parties? I think one of the challenges is that one of the parties wants to pretend like the pandemic never happened at all, and then the other one wants to bury it so deep in the background that we don't want to talk about it anymore. But either way, we're not having a conversation about the most important, most glaring circumstance to have hit us, the root of so many of the challenges that we face today. Whether that's a loneliness epidemic that was put over a tipping point by a moment that forced us further and further into our own online algorithms. Or it's the crisis of our governance and our politics that turns every issue into substrate for our political disagreement. Or it's the way that so many of the departments that we work in, whether they're academic departments or government departments, seem so broken all of this rooted in a moment. Now, I've been thinking a lot about 2020 because the parallels seem so clear to 2024. And that's when I came upon a really critical book. And most folks don't want to be thinking about 2020. I think for most of us, we're like, yeah, I don't really, I, I agree, we're gonna talk about that. But the book makes a really important central argument, which is the only way to get through trauma is to look at it in the eye. And our failure to do that leaves us stuck in this society-wide PTSD that frames so much of the challenges that we face today, but without allowing us to actually have a conversation about it. And so 
that's why I am so excited for our conversation today. Now, before I go on and introduce our guest, I've just got to say, about that election, everybody, y'all go out and vote. Now, this is a 501c3 organization. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. But I am going to tell you that if you have not voted, you better figure out how to do that before next Tuesday. And then you better figure out how to call your aunties and your uncles and your brothers and your sisters and your kids if they're of voting age and your neighbors and your colleagues and that person you wave to every morning and you better make sure that they go out and vote before Tuesday, November 5th. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest today. He is Professor Eric Kleinenberg. He's the Helen Gould Shepherd Professor in the Social Sciences and Director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU. He's got appointments all over the place. And today, we're talking about his most recent book. It's called 2020, One City, Seven People, and the Year That Changed Everything. Without further ado, please give a big, warm APHA welcome to our guest today, Professor Eric Kleinenberg. So, to kick us off, you spend much time at public health conferences? First time here, actually. First All right. Time. Welcome. Wait, lo wait, lo long time listener? Long time listener? Can I say that? Yeah, first time caller? So, you know, the, the, <laughs> first, uh, the, the first book I wrote was a book about a heat wave in Chicago, my home city. And uh, thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to bring my mother with me when I go to give talks in large rooms. Um, so I, I, I had this like warm embrace from the public health community uh, and spent a lot of time uh, with social epidemiologists and historians of public health. And, and since then, it's always been a kind of core audience I keep in mind when I'm writing. And this, this last book about 2020 uh, is the first thing I've done that's really squarely back uh, here. So it's really an honor to be here at the convention and on your podcast. Um, looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, it's a, it's a real honor to have you. So if you haven't read Heat Wave, uh, it was one of the first books that I was, uh, I was asked to read on my first day working in a social epidemiology research group when I was in college. And I remember reading through that book, and you take pains to identify the difference between the hazard of it getting really hot and the disaster of people dying of that. And... In coming back to 2020, I, I mean, I've read all of, your, all of your work, but this one felt like taking a far, that exact same approach to a far bigger disaster. And I mean, all of us in this, in, in this auditorium, all of us in this field are kind Feels of Feels like weird. an arena, actually. It does. It, it really arena, does. Yeah. But all of us are kind of odd because we spend a lot of our days working on things that most folks don't want to have to pay attention to. You've written this book about 2020, which, again, most of us don't want to have to pay attention to. <laughs> but you, you went back and you were like, you know, I really want to understand yeah. what happened here. Yeah. What motivated you to go back to 2020 when everybody else yeah. is really trying to do everything they can not to have to think about it? Does this chair have like a sliding element where I can, we, can, <laughs> we can just turn it into a psychoanalysis session? How does that make you feel? <laughs> uh, exactly. So um, th there is a, there's definitely a great um, psychoanalytic answer to your question. But I'll tell you, you know, uh, since I wrote this, uh, the Heat Wave book, a, a lot of my career has been organized around the idea that, um, that, that crises are, are really worth studying uh, because, uh, because crises reveal things. If we, if we look closely at what happens as things begin to break down, we, we can learn who we are, we can learn what we value, and I think most importantly, we can learn whose lives matter. Mm. And the, the problem is that so often that kind of moment of clarity that a crisis induces is fleeting. And uh, if it's the case that we have an urge to get beyond it, uh, then it's even shorter. And, and I guess 
during the event, in the, in the early days of the, event, of the event, I got lured into studying it because you remember in those first weeks, the World Health Organization said, you know, we have this new virus and we don't know how to treat the disease and uh, we, we don't really have great ways to reduce its transmission, so we're recommending that everyone do this new thing called social distancing. Mm. And, I, and I read that concept and I remembered that, you know, that when people died in the heat wave, they, they died of isolation. And it, it felt to me that the, the danger of telling people to socially distance is it kind of created a message like, close your doors and pretend the rest of the world isn't happening and it will come out when it's over. And clearly, you know, that's an arrangement that doesn't work for enormous numbers of people and that would put a, a, a huge numbers of people at risk. And I, and I wrote this op-ed uh, you know, saying the messaging is wrong. What, what, what actually we need is physical distance and social solidarity. Mm. Like, well, the way to get through a pandemic is physical distance when it's necessary and social solidarity. And um, that, that message resonated with some people and it got me hooked into it and I, and I stayed, stayed on it. I just started doing research. And as things started to um, grow less dire, it became clear to me that everybody was ready to move on. And I, and I knew that would be a fatal mistake because if we don't learn the lessons from what we lived through in 2020, we really are doomed to uh, you know, do something similar next time. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, I think the last few years I've grown more convinced that that's an issue. We're so, so reluctant to go back there. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad we're gonna have this conversation and try. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that because I, I feel exactly the same way. And so much of what the response has been has been to figure out some rationale for not having to pay attention to this gigantic trauma. It's too painful, it's too difficult, it's too indicting of the people who are in positions of leadership. So the convenient thing is to ignore it and because most of the public wants to ignore it too, we're all kind of just moving in that direction. And to your point, those who don't study their history are doomed to repeat it. America Dissected is brought to you by Marguerite Casey Foundation. Marguerite Casey Foundation is proud to partner with Haymarket Books to bring you a very special edition of Boston Review Magazine, exploring what it will take to get the state to serve social justice. Leading the forum for this issue, Marguerite Casey Foundation Freedom Scholar Olufemi Otaiwo offers an illuminating exploration of how fossil capital has captured the state and what can be done about it. With responses and analysis by Thea Riofranos, Mariah Mikaba, Andrea Ritchie, Ishe Diwan, Bright Simons, and many others. This is an issue you don't want to miss. Sign up now to get your free Boston Review issue delivered to your door at caseygrants.org slash state. That's C-A-S-E-Y-G-R-A-N-T-S dot org slash state. I want to talk a little bit about equity, right? Because that, that is one of the important pieces. It's a subtext of the experience of the pandemic and a pretext of, of the book. And I think one of the challenges, right, to your point about social distancing is that the, the, the lie of resources and modernity almost is this idea that each person is an entity on the, unto themselves and does not need other people to thrive. Yeah. And that becomes increasingly dangerous the less resources people have. And so folks are constantly in this position where they're told to act as independent when they don't have the resources to do so. And this falls hardest on black and brown communities across our country. And I think nowhere was that made more plain than during the pandemic. Yeah. One of the hard parts about the narrative we've had about equity though, is that it's, I think it's been overly simplified. And there's, a, there's an individual that you talk to throughout the book. Her name is uh, Sophia Zayas. And she's interesting because this is somebody who grew up in the Bronx from a lower middle income household, a woman of color, who rather than not having access to the system, was actually a part of the system, worked for the Cuomo administration as a key go-to, yeah. a go-between between the local community and the, uh, and the administration. And as the vaccine rolled out, she became increasingly convinced not to take it. Right. And I, her story is really interesting, and I, yeah. I wanna ask you to reflect on both her inclusion in the book yeah. and 
in some ways, both how she violated the traditional narrative that we have about equity, yeah. and also what she teaches us about the actual real, re, the reality of trying to be equitable in the way that we engage. Yeah, so, so she's an amazing woman and a great character in the book. And just to step back a second, the, the way the book works is that there, there's seven people whose stories I follow really closely, one from each borough of New York City. And I chose each person because their story as I got to know them seemed to hit a lot of the big themes that I thought about you know, when I told the story of a borough. So Sophia in the Bronx, the total hit. And I realized when I finished the five boroughs, there were a couple stories that I missed. And one was the story of the, uh, the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. We're in Minneapolis, so we should you know, make sure we acknowledge that that is a central part of 2020 and also a central part of the, the, of the book. Um, and I wanted someone who, whose life was really about the movement for black lives that year. And so there's a character I brought in who does that. And then I realized, having followed the story of six people through the year, what I really missed is the story of someone who died early. And I found the, um, a family of a, a subway custodian mm. uh, for the New York City system uh, who had, you know, was a mathematician uh, and physicist from India who immigrated to the US to create opportunities for his kids. And um, he worked as a custodian for 30 years and died in the early weeks when, when New York City said, uh, the MTA said uh, subway workers cannot wear masks at work because there was a uniform violation. And his wife was a nurse, and the nurse's hospital was scrambling to get masks. So that, that the family had to live with that contradiction, and he died tragically. And, and with each of the characters, I think especially um, Sophia, I, I was looking for someone who, whose story was real and complex, and it was not like a, a thin kind of cardboard, uh, you know, uh, uh, character. And so Sophia, you know, grew up in the Bronx, as you mentioned. She's, she's Puerto Rican. She's black and, and Latina. And um, she worked as the Bronx regional representative for the governor's office. And that meant her job was making sure that all of the organizations and institutions in the Bronx had the resources they needed to deal with the pandemic, which was an impossible job. Yeah. And you know, she was getting uh, ventilators and PPE for the hospitals in the Bronx, right? Trying to um, get uh, air filtration systems for the schools when it was, was time to do that. Uh, helping small businesses stay open. And she lived in a building that was hit hard uh, by the, by the uh, disease. Her grandfather lived across the street and seven of his closest friends died in the building. Uh, she, the location of her apartment was on a street where ambulances went all the time, so she, she felt like she was hearing sirens all the time, totally traumatized by this experience. There was no question for her about how real and dangerous COVID was. She's no COVID denier. But Sophia, being a, a black woman who knows American history and the history of medicine, a Puerto Rican woman who knows American history, uh, became very concerned that the vaccines were being rolled out too quickly. And interestingly, one of the things that Cuomo did, and he had a very checkered uh, you know, experience in history in the, in the pandemic, many of you will know that he suppressed the data on nursing home deaths. Um, uh, Cuomo did realize that vulnerability in the Bronx was especially high, and he targeted the Bronx for uh, early rollout of vaccines and had these big mass vaccination events, including one at Yankee Stadium. Uh, for Sophia and for a number of people she represented, that raised the question of whether vaccines were being used in an experimental way mm. on a vulnerable population. And, and no one could tell her that the vaccines were absolutely vetted and safe. And so she did do her job. You know, she went and did the outreach, uh, uh, but she refused to take the vaccine early on and then sadly got COVID and got a very bad case of COVID during one of the vaccine distribution days. Yeah. And I think one of, the, one of the reasons her story is important is because in learning about her, we see just how challenging it was to live through this period for all of us. And you know, the alternate chapters of the book are much more analytic. They take on big questions like why we were killing each other over wearing masks and why we had spikes in violence in the US when other countries didn't. But the characters like Sophia are there to remind us of the kind of soulful challenges that I think we all faced trying to get through that year. And people working in the public health community, I think, 
had an especially trying time. Yeah, I, I really appreciate her inclusion because some of her insights about, on the one hand, spending her days, very, very long days, in the middle of a pandemic, getting other people vaccines, and her own reasons for choosing not to take one, I think speak to the complexity of the trust that we have failed to build. And the worry that I have, and the reason that I think it's so important for an audience like this one to be thinking about this question is, we are living in an interregnum. I think we want to think that the pandemic is over and that the worst has befallen us and that we hope that we can rebuild. But there is going to be another public health threat, right? Whether it's HPAI, which is a fancy way of saying bird flu, right, for, for the listeners, or it's something we've never seen before. There is something else coming. And the choices we make today are going to shape whether or not people trust us next time. And I think part of the challenge is we've bought into a broader narrative about being on the defensive when a lot of the trust building that has to happen happens in local communities in specific moments when the attention is not on us. And I think it's important for us to understand that you can both, like the cognitive dissonance of both getting other people vaccines and not taking one yourself is tough to square until you ask, what was your own experience of this institution that you're being told to trust today? And have they shown up for you for the things you knew you needed before they asked you to show up for the things that seem very new that you're not so quite sure that you need? Um, the, the other person that's such an obvious contrast mm. in the book to Sophia is Danny Presti. Yeah. And Danny is somebody who made national news uh, by declaring a... Uh, autonomous zone in Staten Island uh, around his pub. But one of the things that you do so well is to identify this person who the narrative identifies as this anti-vaxxer COVID denier in the context of his own humanity and this, this, the, the, the reasons why he gets to where he gets to. Yeah. And you trace his evolution from a guy who's just trying to make some money with, in, in his bar to somebody who's now become the face of this anti-vaxxer movement. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about Danny and about how he shapes your thinking about so much of what created this big, broad public narrative that we've got? Yeah, well, D Danny is a complicated case too. And I'll, I'll be honest, you know, the first time I learned about this guy was, you know, one night on social media during 2020, we we're all at home and I saw someone start tweeting about the Proud Boys uh, and other members of the far right who had arrived in New York City, um, you know, for this rally. And that, as I'm saying this, it, it just, I don't know how many of you are busy with your phones today, but there's literally a far right demonstration at Madison Square Garden happening at this minute, uh, where the, 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 the virulence of the racism is like the kind of thing we haven't seen, uh, you know, in, it's, since a frightening moment in the 20th century. Uh, and it's, 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 it's terrifying to see 2020 come back. Yeah, 2020 is not over, y'all. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I mean this with no disrespect because I want to be clear that I think that long COVID is a really serious medical condition that we need to be dealing with more seriously than we have. But long COVID is also a social condition that we're kind of trapped in. And that is yet another reason um, I, 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 I wrote this book is it feels to me like so many of the conditions that were present in 2020, the distrust and the, the anger, the division, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of violent sentiment uh, uh, is, is, is still with us. It's like it wasn't there. It, it was there before 2020, but it just got whipped up and intensified and we have not been able to get it out of our system. And it seems to me like that's so much of what's fueling 2024's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrible moments. Danny, I read about on social media because this rally was happening and I wanted to understand what, what it was about. And it turns out that he and a buddy of his had started a bar in Staten Island and that opened in late 2019. And, you know, he saw himself before this happened as an apolitical guy. Um, you know, he's from Staten Island, so he knows the, that's the most conservative part of New York City by far. And he knows about what, what the politics are there, but he, 
He didn't want to have a political bar. In fact, it was really clear to him and his friend they wanted a community hub, a place where people could socialize, you know, after softball games and uh, you know, community meetings. The, there was sports on TV, but not news. And you know, he was very frustrated, he said, because they actually applied for their liquor license in early 2019. It took nine months to get the license from the state of New York. And they kept reaching out to ask when it would happen. And they felt like the, the regulators were really arrogant and obnoxious and dismissive. Like, you'll get your license when you get it. You know, they made them feel really bad about it. They invested a lot of money. They, they finally opened. And a couple months later, the city was shut down. And, and Danny also accepted that there was a pandemic and that they needed to close, but it kept feeling to him like the closures were arbitrary and he couldn't get a clear explanation of when they could be open and what the goal was for returning New York City to normal. And when he tried to reach out to local people, the, the feeling he got was that they didn't really have time for him. And he noted, you know, like as soon as the pandemic closure started, the liquor authority hired scores of people to scour the city and ticket every establishment that stayed open, which you know, to us in public health land makes perfect sense. And to him from the perspective of a small business owner, it was like, well, what is the point of your authority to prevent people like me from making money? Mm -hmm. like how, well, it, is a, it is a problem when people can't socialize and it's a problem for small business owners when they can't open. And he got more and more frustrated as the year went on. And finally, in the second wave of you know, major shutdowns uh, in the fall of 2020, he, you know, uh, started listening to right-wing radio and right-wing television and identified with the kind of anger about restrictions. They felt unjustified, especially where he lived. And he declared his bar an autonomous zone. And there's a, a long story that follows, but I tell his story in the book because I think it's important for people who aren't thinking about this to try to grapple with why so many Americans got radicalized on the right during that time and, and how it is that the kind of seeds of this resentment that I think is so, such a powerful part of our political culture um, you know, really sprouted up at, at that time. Even though Trump lost the election in 2020, there was a, a shift for a lot of people in this country, like they'd had enough. And I, and I actually think one of the reasons it's important for us to have this conversation at an APHA meeting and to a community of people who care about the standing of public health is that I tell, I, I tell Presti's story sympathetically, not, not I, I personally disagree with his politics, but I want you to understand where he's coming from and see him the way that he sees himself. And I really tried to do justice to his view of the world or take him very seriously. And it's important because I fear that in his story we also see some of the ideas behind this attack on public health as a profession, uh, uh, you know, as, a, as an industry, as a science, as a part of government. And that worries me because soon after fighting fires and controlling the streets for crime, managing public health crises is like one of the things at the heart of the intellectual justification for a welfare state yeah. Yeah. and for a modern society. <clears throat> and when I look at the attacks on public health in this country right now, I, I, I fear that if those attacks get established and entrenched in our broader public policy, it means not only are we going to be so much worse off in the, when the next thing hits, but we might also be losing one of the core foundational bricks for the notion that a good society is redistributive and provides protection to the most vulnerable people. Yeah. So there's so much on the line in this. I, I really appreciate that broader context. And I, I think one of the tough parts is we who've chosen to go into this field believe that public health is such an ultimate good. The well-being of people's bodies and minds is such an ultimate good that there aren't other things that can be compared and there is no opportunity cost to intervening for the public health. And that's just not true. And one of the places, as a, in my, my day job, I run a, a local health department. And one of the places that I, I come up on this consistently is when it comes to uh, food safety enforcement. And 
I think it's easy to say, hey, listen, you're not following the rules, so we're going to enforce on you, which means that we're going to give you a cease and desist. You've got to shut down your restaurant. On the other side of it, though, is the question of you've got an individual who may be the sole owner operator of a dream that they had one day to open up a restaurant to serve their grandma's home cooking to the community. And they don't got huge amounts of operating capital. They're trying to make ends meet, and they're trying to figure out how to feed their family and run this establishment. Nobody wants to make people sick. Like, there's not a restaurant operator out there who's like, can't wait to like, you know, this is gonna be the place that the outbreak happens. Nobody <laughs> wants that, right? And so their interests are our interests, but sometimes, you know, there is this sort of focus on these are the rules, we enforce the rules, without stepping back and saying, but this is actually an ecosystem. And our job is to focus on part of that ecosystem while fostering the ecosystem. We all benefit when this place is clean and healthy. So if our only approach here is to enforce, 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 are we actually doing what's best for our local community? Because if we get in an adversarial relationship with all the restaurant owners in our community, I don't think that's gonna work out very well for us. It's not gonna work out for them, and you know who's gonna hurt the most? The community. And so I think sometimes we forget that what we do has an, has an opportunity cost. And if we don't take that opportunity cost seriously, and if we're not thoughtful about how we engage with people who will bear the brunt of that opportunity cost, it doesn't work out well for anybody. And you create unnecessary opposition when a conversation and an engagement could have been more powerful. And I think the, the, the thing I, that, that really struck me about Danny's story, and I, you do a great job of humanizing him, is that this person didn't start the pandemic as an anti-vaxxer uh, ideologue. This wasn't somebody who was like, you know what, I got it in for public health. Right. But by the end, he doesn't even talk to you anymore. No, he won't, and, and, and it was anti-vax, anti-masks, he got involved in a whole array of you know, far-right activist projects. And uh, you know, this conversation reminds me, you know, it, early in the book, I write about the, the kind of the role of public health and the fact that you know, public health is a complex science, it also engages with other kinds of science in really complicated, you know, tricky ways. So, and I think it's worth talking about these trade-offs and talking about the costs and benefits of public health approaches. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm a, I'm a sociologist, so I'm a step away from the field. Um, and I, but you're an honorary public health person. So. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, but, but there are these things about. Uh, the making of public health policy that I think are really worth consideration because you know you're bringing up the issue of restaurants and like how how we feel if we think our restaurants have been shut down and we have strong feelings about it and we have strong feelings about closing our gyms and you know many cities close their parks they close the beaches they close the basketball courts but the thing that's the most contentious of course is that we close schools right. for a very long period of time and yes Danny Presti has been radicalized on the right because of what he feels to be an incursion of his right to, to do business and to feed his family. But I think that there are a lot of Americans now who are skeptical of public health as a science because they believe that their children suffered unnecessarily and that they suffered unnecessarily because we kept the schools closed for a long time. And we all know, and here's something you know, sociologists really know, that talk about inequality. Who suffers the most from learning loss? or from the opportunities to uh, have, uh, to, to work. You know, poor people to who are disproportionately black and, and Latino again. So, so there are costs to public health policies. Now, it's not clear to me that it's the job of the public health professional to do all that cost and benefit calculation. It seems to me like when we, if, we, if we focus too much on the power of the public health scientist or the public health official, we forget that, in fact, it's the president of the United States, right, who's managing. You might remember we had a, a presidential task force, and I think the head of it was um, not a major figure in public health, Mike Pence. Anybody here remember Mike Pence? <laughs> and, and, and that was an odd choice. Um, so I don't think this falls on I want to be really clear. I don't think this falls on the public health community 
you know, to think about the costs and benefits alone. That it, one could argue that the job of the public health scientist is to say, here's the best way to shut down the, you know, reduce the transmission of this disease. Yeah. Right? Here's the best way to, to reduce mortality. But I do think we need a reckoning when it comes to how we have conversations about what the collateral damage that closures did to our society. And, you know, I was down with a lot of these pro programs at the time, uh, but I can tell you that the standing of public health as a field, I think, is also in, in jeopardy in, because a lot of families are upset with what they feel yeah. were excessive restrictions. And, and that's just a hard thing to deal with. And, and the worry also, and, and this is a consistent conversation I've been having with superintendents in our community, which is we decided to shut down schools based on an abundance of caution and a virus we didn't understand. And it turns out that this virus was not particularly dangerous among children. We all got really lucky, right? And that was just the natural history of that virus. And kids got sick and kids died. I don't want to say that they didn't, but I'm saying it's not, it wasn't particularly dangerous for children, which creates a space now where we say, should we have actually done this? Because the cost, as you talked about, of shutting down schools is really big. But here's the interesting issue, is that we're often, as we talked about, we're an inter in, in an interregnum. And oftentimes when you act, you need to be able to preserve space to act next time. So the big public health scare that we're all watching right now is an influenza. And we know about influenzas, and influenzas kill kids. They kill kids every single year. So if we were to have an HPAI outbreak pandemic, right, there would be a very clear argument about the need to act when it comes to schools. But I'll tell you that we will be hamstrung and many, many communities will not do the thing that probably needs to be done because of what happened last time. So there is a cost to future public health action of being potentially overly abundantly cautious. And that's the thing that even if we're not taking into account the local opportunity cost, there is always the opportunity cost of next time. And so if you don't act in a way that preserves and builds trust, the next time when you really, really may need to act, you end up sounding like the boy who cried wolf. And that is a big worry that, that I have. And, and then the other part of it is also when you talk. Like, we need to be having a lot of these conversations about why we did what we did, not in a broad national level but in local communities with specific people about what the choice was, why the choice was made, and how we should think about making choices next time, right? Because again, we've gotta be thinking about next time. America Dissected is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that Americans consume roughly a credit card's worth of plastic a week? Yeah, that's right. The products that we're using every day are ultimately contaminating our water supply, generating hundreds of microplastics that we end up ingesting. So Blue Land set out to do something about it. They want to eliminate the need for single-use plastic in the products we reach for the most. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet, with the same powerful clean you're used to. The idea? It's simple. They offer refillable cleaning products with a beautiful, cohesive design that looks great on your counter. Just fill your reusable bottles with water, drop in the tablets, and wait for them to dissolve. You'll never have to grab bulky cleaning supplies on your grocery run again. The refills start at just $2.25 and you can even set up a subscription or buy in bulk for additional savings. From cleaning sprays to hand soap, toilet bowl cleaner and laundry tablets, all Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients you can feel good about. Blue Land is trusted in over a million homes, including ours. I love the fact that I can do my part to eliminate single-use plastic without sacrificing on quality and price. I also love the fact that I'm doing my part to address the climate crisis by reducing the shipping of water. And my family loves the ease and simplicity. Blue Land has a special offer for listeners. Right now, get 15% off your first order by going to blueland.com slash America. You won't want to miss this. Blueland.com slash America for 15% off. That's blueland.com slash America to get 15% off. I'm so happy you said that because I want to be clear. I, I don't feel like we could be prescriptive about what the right thing to do is next time. I don't even think we can properly do the assessment of you know, whether we did the right thing in all cases around the school thing last right. time. But what I know for certain 
is that we've been afraid to have the conversations. Right. We haven't had the reckoning. And to this point, it is hard to do science in real time when there's a crisis. And, and when there's a, a pandemic that's spreading and mortality figures are soaring, it is hard to know when the science is good enough to make an intervention. And so clearly, uh, for the public health community, there's a question of how do we convey what we know and don't know? H how do we talk openly about uncertainty? In this political climate, where there's distrust and division and partisanship, how do we talk about our uncertainty, assure our communities that we're doing the best we can without being too afraid to act? And, and it is inevitable that people running public health programs and people in positions of political power will make wrong calls in a situation like that. There's no way you cannot make wrong calls because it is a novel situation and we're learning. That doesn't mean you have to be paralyzed, but it also doesn't mean you have to speak as if you, as if you know everything. I am terrified by the scenario that you raised where in the next health crisis, the, the reigning perspective, the reigning interpretation of what happened in COVID is that none of this stuff worked. We, did, we didn't need to close down, right? We should have kept the schools open. We should have kept the businesses open. We should never have worn masks. The, N, N, the NPIs don't work. I'm, I'm, there is an organized effort happening right now while we're sitting in this room by a number of powerful institutions and political actors to discredit every NPI intervention right, that was made in, in COVID and to take down the, this paradigm of public health that produced for us the COVID response. And it is, is a radical move. And I think it's the question for the public health community now is what's the, you know, what's the response? What's the, what's the proactive way of explaining what happened in 2020? And how do we think about the role of public health moving forward. That conversation will inevitably be, you know, need us to think about the things that didn't go perfectly. And we don't have to say that everything went perfectly. Yeah. Um, but but we, we need to have that conversation. And it, for me, it feels like a completely urgent project. And having that conversation, I love that you said proactive, because having that conversation from the position of defensiveness, I worry, it, it solidifies, it ossifies the nature of the discussion we're having. And the worry that I have is about how we're having that conversation, which is a, a helpful way into this new conversational space that we're in. One of the things that you talk a lot about uh, is about the way that our conflicts have become semantic conflicts yeah. played out in a digital space. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that we're not, in the past, when you thought about national level or even international level conflict, you could sieve them down into a series of debates you could imagine two sides having. And there was nuance in those debates because you understood that you were trying to figure out where the right terrain was. And the logic of the internet with algorithmic amplification and the way that everything gets reduced down into in effect meme wars means that you end up having inevitably tugs of war. And folks almost are more interested in relief of the semantic conflict than they are in identifying what the truth actually is. And like once you get it, it's like Danny Presti's, like once you get on, on one side of the tug of war, Anything that hurts, hurts the other side helps you, by definition, and vice versa. And it's not a very good way for trying to think about how to identify truth and what we should do next. Can you tell us a little bit about how we're still reckoning with the onlineification of our discourse yeah. and what that kind of means for being able to have the kind of discussion that you're, you're uh, pointing to here? Yeah, well, so in one part of the book, you know, I had a postdoc uh, who was a specialist in studying digital media, and we just tried to like live through the pandemic with a set of far-right Facebook groups, and then another set of like liberal and progressive Facebook groups. And it will not surprise you to know that um, you lived a completely different 
2020 based on what your social media experience was. And so I think part of the, you know, the challenge of doing social science, you know, doing, doing sociology or public health, just making sense of the world at this moment is like, it's a kind of choose your own adventure reality. And it's very hard to find a shared set of facts. It's just exceedingly difficult. And so I guess the first thing I wanna say is this, it, it's important to notice as an empirical matter that to the extent that people live their lives online during a time of shutdowns and isolation, which is to say people were really living online, uh, pe people experience very different realities. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the conversation. That's part of the trouble right now is like, how do we put the pieces back together? I think we got a little ensconced in these worlds. And in the book, the way that I try to narrate the kind of convergence of, the, of, of um, these problems in our offline and online lives is through the story about, about masks. And I, if, if we could go there for a second, I Please. just think it's, it's so fascinating, you know, because um, one might think in the abstract that if there's a new potentially lethal virus, it's coronavirus, and we know that there's some history of masks being used to, you know, prevent transmission, that in the absence of something else good, people would just do it. Um, and clearly there are a lot of societies on earth that, that did that, you know, that just started wearing masks. And, um, you know, many of them had experience with SARS, and so they had a lesson in the power of masks. Others are, you know, Asian societies where mask wearing is already more of a norm. Um, but you'll remember that the WHO did not uh, re recommend mask use, and there's a controversy around that. You know, was the WHO taking its lead from China, which didn't want to make the pandemic seem like it was going to be real? Was the WHO concerned about the global supply of masks? Like, what, what was? No, no one really knows what was going on because the, the, their claim was they weren't going to recommend it until they had specific empirical evidence that. Um, that wearing masks would be helpful for this specific coronavirus. And since it was new, of course, we didn't have that. So a lot of places used the precautionary principle and just did it. Here we didn't. And the thing I got so puzzled by is, well, there are a lot of countries in the world where rates of mask wearing was low, lower than the US even. It's very hard to find places where, as in the United States, whether you wore a mask sparked conflict yeah. and even violence. And I got really curious about what happened. And I, I think it's worth pointing this story out because I think we're still living inside of this thing. April 3rd, the CDC changes its policy and its guidelines on masks. Uh, the 45th president gets up at a news conference. He announces the new policy, like the CDC's changed their position. They want you to wear a mask in public. And then he says this incredible thing. He says, personally, I'm not going to do it. And, and that is an incredible statement, right? To be the president of the United States and to announce that the CDC is recommending one set of things, but to say that personally I'm not going to do it. You know, presidents don't have absolute power. I want to say yet, uh, but that's <laughs> scary to say. But, but, but presidents have Hopefully a lot never. of power. Yeah, presidents do have a lot of power. Did I say we all should go vote? <laughs> <laughs> please, please yeah. vote. Um, presidents do have a lot of power to shape our opinion and our behavior during moments of uncertainty. And it becomes really clear to people in, in, in his inner circle that you know, wearing a mask to Trump means cowardice, fear, weakness, femininity, you know, things he doesn't like. And do you remember this moment? It took place just a few miles from here. Mike Pence, head of the White House task force, goes to the Mayo Clinic. And he is the only person in the zip code who's not wearing a mask. He's with sick patients, he's with medical doctors, nurses, he refuses to wear a mask. And it becomes really clear that if you're on the right in this country, to not wear a mask is your way of expressing a whole political worldview, right? You bare your face as a way of showing which side you're on. But this is where I think it's really important for people in this room, you know, for us to take seriously what happens on the other side, which is like, people like me go out and they, get on Facebook and they put a photograph of themselves with a mask on their Facebook page. You probably remember at this time, all the Democratic candidates for public office start running ads with masks on. And you, know, you change your Twitter handle to Eric, hashtag, wears a mask, Kleinenberg. 
and you, you walk down the street, I don't know if anybody here had this feeling, like I live in New York City, right? And you walk into a grocery store, and there was this moment where in 2020, like if you see someone with a mask, you have this like, yeah, you're on my side, you know, yes, yes. And we had this, like, there was like a solidarity around mask wearing. And then when you saw someone who didn't wear a mask, did anyone have this feeling? It's like your blood starts to boil. You get so angry, like who are you even, right? Do you have any idea what you're doing to me and all the people here? Like we, we got so angry. And, and what had happened is that we had turned this little piece of fabric into a totem, into an icon. It suddenly it carried all the weight of our political ideology. It became a part of your identity. Absolutely. And, 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 so that's so, and, and so then we got trapped in it. First, like, first it was about the, the mask, and then it was like, remember? Oh, if you're on Team Blue, you, you take Remzidivir if you're sick. If you're on Team Red, you take Ivermectin. And then it was like, if you're on Team Blue, you take the vaccine. And if you're on Team Red, you, you don't, you know, unless you're, you're, you're older. And, and that's wild, right? Because arguably the most successful part of Trump's 2020 re policy response was Operation Warp Speed. And like, you, you, you might remember like this time, in, it, a little before in October 2020, he was trying to get the FDA to approve the vaccines so that he could have the, the rollout, yep. right? And, and, and honestly, like, had the FDA approved it, he would have called, like, the Pfizer one Ivana, right? And the, <laughs> right? And the Moderna one would have been called Ivanka. And, and Americans would have all, like, all, like, and then, like, the right would have taken the vaccine, but the left wouldn't have taken the vaccine. It's, it's mind-bending. And so, but, but, but of course, what happened is that by 2021, he didn't want to champion it because he didn't want Biden to get credit for it. And now we have this incredible disparity where the, the COVID vulnerability flips. And after, like, after the vaccines come out, it's the red states that start to have the highest COVID mortality because they're not taking the vaccine. But basically what's happened is like, we've just pulled farther apart in our ideologies, in our online political lives. And it's or, like public health, I want you to understand, is at the root of so much of this stuff. And it's so important for us to figure out, like, regardless of what happens on November 5th and 6th and 7th and 8th, like, regard, regardless of what happens, you know, in this election, and it's probably going to be a slog, there's going to be a, a, a moment where we're going to have to figure out how to put the pieces back together again. Yeah. And, and, and I want us to be thinking about how we reckon with all this then. And, and part, of the th part of the thing that I think is really important here is I would venture to guess that in this room, among the folks who will listen to this podcast, 99.99% generally think about and identified in one way. And it used to be in this country that public health was not politicized. Public health was a matter of political consensus that everybody agreed on. Now, on the one hand, your response to that could be like, why are those folks go crazy? Fair. On the other though, if we believe that we can't continue to go on this way, it really is incumbent on us to be curious about how we talk about and engage with public health in ways where we don't necessarily have to get folks to identify in a particular political way to do things that are good for themselves and their communities, right? And I think it's to be, on, on the one hand, I don't know that we, can, we can't do this alone, but I will tell you that there are some folks who may not agree with 99% of this room on a lot of political ideas, but are interested in this project. And I think for us, we've got to really be thinking about what does it look like to be able to translate public health in these ways. And I, I you know, call out the state of Indiana, right, that has made major investments in public health, despite not necessarily being the bluest of blue states. And I think it's important for us to really dig in. We had a really great episode with the Indiana Health Commissioner about exactly how they did that. Because we got to get smart about saying, how do we get what we can? We may not have consensus on some of the more controversial questions. I personally believe that reproductive health is public health, right? But if you can't meet me there, can you meet me at the question of saying, OK, what is it that we can work on to prevent influenza or cervical cancer, 
How can we make sure that more people are getting vaccinated for measles? And listen, we'll continue to engage on the question of reproductive health because I personally think there is no public health without reproductive health. But can we talk about those things that we can agree on, right, in a conversation that will get more people the coverage that they need? Because here's the other thing I'll tell you. If you're serious about equity, okay, if you're serious about equity, remember, then a lot of communities that are governed in a particular way, there are a lot of folks who live downstream of that governance who are deeply affected by what happens there. And if we're not able to translate what tends to happen is low-income folks, people of color, folks in rural communities go without basic resources, right, that we believe we need to make sure we're providing. And I think this question of how we talk about this in ways that are as inclusive as possible is really critical. I want to move to the, the, the question really is the central thesis of the book, which is that we really can't get past what happened in 2020 without talking about 2020 yeah. in a productive way. I know that you, know, you wrote a whole book into this space, and I imagine that, you know, I, I, I know there are a lot of folks who've really critically engaged with it, but a lot of folks are like, I don't want to read a book about 2020. Yeah. Yeah. How do you actually get folks to start paying attention? How do we process this trauma so that we're not doomed to repeat it? I, I mean, I'll tell you that um, for me, the, the biggest challenge is getting people in the room, right? Or, or to, open, you know, to open the book. And I, I do think that a lot of people have just a visceral inability to go back there. And so it's hard for me to know how to solve that problem. Um, this was, this was a, hard, it's a hard book to sell as a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, the hope is it's a book with here's a, about, with here's a, a book tail. about the worst era of your life. <laughs> I mean, because, right, like, who, who wants a reminder of what we otherwise work so hard to forget? And, and that, that is a really difficult question. Um, what I have found consistently, and you all will be the judge of this more than I can be, is that it's actually very rewarding to go back and start to think this through. And, 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 and honestly, there are these, they're, they're the scientific puzzles that are just interesting to think about. You know, for instance, like why, why there was this spike in violence in the US but not in other places, not just gun violence, which is an easy one for us to answer. We have lots of guns. Um, but, you know, vehicular manslaughter, sorry, vehicular manslaughter, yeah, and reckless driving, and, uh, all, all, all kinds of, um, of uh, acts that just didn't, we didn't see in other countries. That there are questions like that. And why did, why did trust go down so precipitously here when it went up in Australia, mm. um, which also had a right-wing gover you know, government and a prime minister who was a science denier and high levels of polarization. Like, so there's, there's analytic puzzles. But I think like the... The way I've tried to have the conversation above all is, is to do what you've been doing in, in our conversation, which is to like go back to some of the, the, the people and, to, and, to, and, and through their stories to try to encourage us to revisit what we were going through personally, you know, what, what we were struggling with. Because I think a lot of us have, you probably can relate to the, this kind of collective response, which is like the moment it became okay to go back to something like normal life. I think we were all pretty eager to kind of wrap up our trauma and put it in a box and slide it under the couch or into the closet so we wouldn't have to think about it. I really believe that our, our, our collective response to this year has been a will not to know. And I think that the kind of perversions of this year are reminding us of like the of the folly of that, like just the and, and here's like here's the thing that I, I I just so puzzle over this question. If you look at the main kind of statistical indicators we use to make sense of like the, the state of the country, you know, like the un unemployment is way down from where it was, crime is way down from where it was. So twenty nine like the. Crime drop in this country for the last couple of years has been extraordinary. If you look at the stock market, right? If you look at um, 
inflation, like inf inflation is way down, and it's way down compared to all the countries we compete with, especially. And, and obviously, you know, global inflation was not caused by American policy, right? Like on paper, it looks like the United States should be feeling pretty good about itself at this moment. Like nobody in America feels good about what's happening in America right now. And I, it could be that we're looking at the wrong numbers, but I actually think a huge part of this sense of dis-ease that we have in this moment is that we're stuck in the emotional trauma of 2020. Like we haven't, we haven't gotten out of it because we haven't been willing to kind of think about what we experienced. And so that, that's like, I don't know if that's a very sexy pitch, let me tell you, but, but I do think like that's, that's the reality, right? Like if you're, if you're a person who was traumatized as a child, the best way through that is not to pretend it never happened, right? And, and I also think like collectively and individually, there is no getting past what happened here in 2020 without us taking time to make sense of it. Yeah. And so we, 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 ha we just have to. Friends, I want to recommend To See Each Other, a podcast that complicates the narrative about small town Americans in our most misunderstood communities. Host George Gale travels to Wisconsin to follow a small town battle for the last remaining public nursing home in the community. A conservative county board is hell bent on selling off the facility, but senior citizens aren't having it, showing up to county board meetings, marching in the Labor Day parade, and fighting with their very last breaths. Folks are angry about being treated like they're expendable, and they're deeply afraid about what this means for them. George goes deep into questions of aging in America, public versus private long-term care, and the nuts and bolts of good old-fashioned organizing. This show will make you want to keep up the fight and think differently about aging. Listen to, to See Each Other wherever you get your podcasts. You know, to your point about the, these numbers, I, I think part of that is that there has been, there, there, to, your, to your point earlier, there's not one experience of the pandemic. Each of us has our experience of the pandemic. Communities have their own experience of the pandemic. And I think part of the frustration is the pandemic should have been a moment for us to radically rethink a lot of things. And we still kind of go back to these same aspects of like the way it was before, right? And, you know, yes, our, our stock market looks great, but like 60% of people don't have access to stocks. Yes, our jobless rate is very low, but like the quality of the job does not come with the same benefits. And uh, more people are working multiple gigs than have gainful employment that allows them to go home at a reasonable hour and spend time with their family. And it's hard because in some respects, it's like, the pandemic accelerated a lot of the worst trends in American society that left a lot of people worse off, even if they maximize the things that we're all told to, to value. And I think in so many ways, when you compare, it's almost like when you hear these numbers and you compare your own experience to that, you're just like, but I don't feel included in that. And I think no matter who you are, you're kind of in the same boat unless you're like, you know, Elon Musk. Right? In which case you're like, I bought a social media company, I crashed into the ground, but on the other hand, my rockets are doing okay, so there's that. Who doesn't have that feeling here, right. by the way, yeah. I mean, so, Isn't so, that the most human experience? <laughs> let, let, let me give you what I think is the best example of this. I think you, you've nailed something I think is really important, and I'll tell you like a through line that connects all seven very different people in this book is they, they wound up feeling over the course of the year the sense that like, our core social institutions had let them down. Mm. That, that they had so much that they had to do on their own to get through this. It's like we, we, we didn't really work. And, and e more equally frustrating is that, as you said, and if, kind of, if you can tap back into your 2020 reality for a second, there were all these moments where it looked like maybe something change. extraordinary was about to happen. And here, I think, is the most important moment that I've really spent a lot of time in the book talking about, and it happens to dovetail with your first point about the story of inequality. You remember there was that moment in the first weeks when the virus got to the United States where we were so worried about the outbreak, there was so much death and disease that the government said to us, we need to stop everything. In New York, we went on pause. 
other, other states had different concepts, but the notion was like, the sc your schools are closed, your offices are closed, your restaurants and bars are closed, your gyms are closed, there's no music. Um, stay home as much as you possibly can. Except, remember this, we said, there's one group of people, we've never had this category before, there's one group of people, and you are so important. The, you and the work you do is so important that we are gonna come up with a whole new category for you. Remember this? You wanna tell me? One, two, three. Central. We're gonna call you essential workers. And I live in New York City, right? I know who the essential workers are. They're the finance guys, right? People who work in the white shoe law firms, the Knicks. Um, but, but as it happens, like, but, but, but honestly, we, we don't, we, we know that those aren't the people. The, like sociologically, this is interesting because the reality is there's like an open secret. This is the thing we, we in the social sciences call, it. oh, it's an open secret. We all know that the real essential workers are the people who do retail, the people who drive our public transit, the people who repair infrastructure, the people who clean our buildings and our homes, the people who prepare food, people who deliver the food, the people who work in farms, people who, who work in meatpacking plants, and of course, the people who get the most attention, in this case, people who work in, in healthcare facilities, right? And um, for the people who worked in healthcare facilities, there was that amazing ritual of solidarity where at seven o'clock, when people were coming home, we banged our pots and pans to say thank you. But, for the overwhelming majority of essential workers, it was a very different story. You would think, there was, and there was a moment when you, when you say the open secret out loud, when you say, you are the essential workers, you are the most important people in our society, that when you do that, you are taking on a moral obligation. We will make sure you have PPE. We will make sure you have access to the best health care that money can buy. We will give you a bonus. We will honor you. Uh, right? we, we, we will thank you. you. You would think if you lived in a good society that when you name the essential workers, you're, you're saying out loud, we have to do things differently. Because now, now we're going to be honest. You are not the people who are getting paid the most but we're gonna, we're gonna change things. And it actually felt for a moment like we were walking to the edge of this moral precipice, right? It's the end of neoliberalism, right? Remember that conversation? Things are gonna change. But we got there and then we turned away. And, and the reality is, and we all know this to this day, to be called essential in America in 2020 was to be deemed expendable. To be called essential was to be deemed expendable. And by the way, not just you, but everybody you live with, because you talked about the inequality and it's not, it wasn't just a class and profession-based inequality. Who had the highest death rates in our cities, especially if you lived in New York? There were people who were essential workers who were, were stuck in the labor force, unprotected, because we'd never managed to produce the basic health things that we needed, who then came home to crowded residential units, right? It wasn't density in neighborhoods that did us in, it wasn't the end of cities, but if you lived in a crowded apartment, think about immigrants, right? Think about low-income people in our cities, and you worked in the essential labor force, it was, the whole household. Yeah. So, and, and, and I just think it's, a, it's, it's amazing and shameful and notable that not one of us in this room, I'm guessing, has been talking about essential workers and that the fact that we said that out loud in the last election cycle, the fact that that came up, but I guarantee you that there are a lot of Americans who remember that they were designated for this responsibility that they were basically asked to do this, that they took on those sacrifices, and that all of that 
has been forgotten, and not only has it been forgotten, but they've now been vilified, and they're now being told that if Team Red wins, they can expect to be arrested, moved into a concentration camp, and deported soon. And, I, and that's something we need to be talking about more. And I, and I think, to your point, and, and this is the, I think the crux of it is, we have wiped, we, it's not just that we are looking away from 2020 and failing to learn lessons. It's that there's a whole, to use uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Caitlin Gentilina's term, there's a whole revisionism. And in the absence of all of us lifting and raising that up and asking what it should have deserved and what it tells us about what our society is built upon, there are others who are actively revising that history to wipe it clean, to wipe it away, to wipe the record uh, down so that it's like it never happened. Because it's, that's a, you know, that is a dangerous idea to folks who rely on the particular status quo. There are some people in our society where we just don't pay nearly enough, who are expendable, who don't have a social safety net, right? And I, I just think it's really important if we're actually thoughtful about the kind of future we want to build, that we got to bring it back. And that's why I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us here today and to share uh, your work with us. And, and um, I think for all of us in public health, we have a real responsibility to be thinking about not just learning lessons, but implementing what we learn for the next one, right? Because these are moments where things start to shake. And if all that happens is they shake for a second, whether it's on the role of science in society, whether it's on our uh, relationship to equity, right? And all that happens is that you're like, okay, well, that was weird, and it's like a snow globe. You shake it up, the snow comes up, and then it settles again, and you're back to where you were. Then we miss the opportunity to build the kind of society we really want to build. I, um, we do have a little bit of time for questions, and I want to invite, probably have time for like one or two questions if folks have them. There are mics here in the aisles, so if you'd like to ask a question, we, we welcome uh, questions from folks. What a fascinating discussion. It uh, really could go on for a long time. The, the issue that I have is the corruption that came from not really knowing where did this thing come from. And I think at the very top, because they did not give us a clear ex explanation it opened itself up to conspiracy towards the pharmaceutical companies. And I don't even ha know how do we add RFK <clears throat> to this equation. Thank you. That's a really uh, good question. Yeah. Uh, Look, I, I, I'll say that um, part of the difficulty of um, the political culture now is that, you know, we we had a a very cynical president in the beginning of 2020, who was really intent on using what might have been a moment for unification and collective rebuilding uh, into a, 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 a turning it into a wedge issue to further divide us, and there was such dysfunction coming from the White House that when the lab leak theory got associated with Trump's anti-China perspective, I think a lot of people jumped in to shut it down you know, very quickly. And here's a case where there, there's, there's, there's there, clearly, what, I, even if we don't have definitive evidence about it, it's, it's a, it, it's a plausible possibility, right, for how the virus began. And I think it's worth us collectively asking, you know, why it got shut down the way it did and kind of what the urge to shut it down did to people's faith in public health because they're, you know, as a, as a profession and mode of governance because there is a robust and serious debate to be had about the lab leak theory. And I, I don't, I, obviously none of us in the room know what the real story is, um, but it, I think we need to ask ourselves why it got shut down as quickly as it did. Yeah, I, I wanna pick up on two points here. One is, 
if we lead with science, then we have to lead with science every time. Yes. And I think the hard part is that we watched in a moment where because it got politicized, we let, as a community, our own political biases shape an outcome or an understanding. And we didn't have the benefit of the doubt about there being something we needed to do today, right? Where this came from is a question that is a historical artifact, right? Now, should it shape our public policy moving forward? Sure. But it wasn't of imminent concern right now. And so suspending one's input on a debate about it until we actually know what the science says would have been the prudent thing to do. But what happened is, the minute it got picked up, right, that this was the talking point on Team Red, then a lot of folks were like, well, this must be false. And to your point about pharma, I think this is a really tough situation. You, all of us in this room, I'm sure, have heard of Make America Health Again. And the notion that Robert F. Kennedy may have a platform to inform public health policy in this country is a, a deeply scary thought. Mm. But there's a thing about what he does that I think we ought to study, which is right problem, wrong solution, wronger approach to the solution, right? So the problem with ultra-processed foods, I agree, ultra-processed foods are a bad thing. But they're not a bad thing because of you name the additive. They're a bad thing because they're chock full of sugar and fat. And they are way too easy to get and our, public, our government subsidizes that, right? That's the problem. Or, yes, there are real problems with pharma in our country. It costs way too much to get essential medicines. That is a problem of public policy. The problem with pharma, though, is not that they manufacture vaccines. In fact, it's, it's that they don't manufacture vaccines because there's not money in them, right? And I think it's important for us to, we, we get in this, this situation where we end up looking silly because we don't meet at the premise of saying, yes, that is a problem. But let's talk about why you keep getting the answer wrong to this problem. Instead, we say, well, they're saying it's a problem, so we're saying it's not. And then we end up sounding ridiculous because we feed ourselves through this, like, this, this flattening of discussions where everything they say needs to have an equal opposite against it, in which case we're losing our own narrative. And so it's really important for us to remember that, and this is the mistake I think was made when it came to the, the question of where did this virus come from in the first place. Generic drugs, in many ways, are the unsung hero of our healthcare system, bringing remarkable medical innovations into the hands of millions of Americans. When I found out that I could get the generic version for the first time, like there was like an exhale, <laughs> like honestly, like this changed my life. This medication that was once $130,000 a year to, you know, nothing, the copay is $0. It's like kind of hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> These much cheaper copies of brand name drugs fill nine out of every 10 prescriptions in the US. They save us hundreds of billions of dollars a year. But will affordable, high quality generic drugs continue to be there when we need them? Introducing Race to the Bottom, a new three-part series from trade-offs on the problems plaguing the generic drugs that we all rely on. Listen to part one now, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, my name, oops, my name is Arlene, and first of all, I want to thank you for this great podcast and for bringing back what we need to process in 2020, because I'm sure a lot of us, including me, I've been thinking here what I was doing and what I was feeling and all that stuff. You know, we don't think about that. But I think even more so, I appreciate you saying, not if, when there will be another pandemic, and there will be, as we all know, in public health. Whether that happens in my lifetime, I don't know. But I think the main thing that I gathered from 2020, and a lot of things that are not said, is that we still need to think about and care about each other. As a nurse, that's what my whole life has been. And wearing a mask or not wearing a mask is not the, the issue, it is do you care about you and you and me? That's what we need to think about instead of 
the visible thing or not the visible thing. So I, I, you know, I really appreciate you bringing all this up because it's, it's some good thoughts. Thank you. Appreciate you Just, and your yeah, work. Take that yeah. as a comment. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, here and then here, and let's. I, I want to take the the three questions together. Uh, just to make sure we've got we've got time. Go ahead. Awesome. Um, thank you. I'll chime in. I'm also a nurse um, working at a local health department in North Carolina, and uh, I'm public an health nurses. I'm an, thank assist, you. I'm an assistant health director. Uh, um, and my, assist, well, public health administrators. So, Mike, this has been really helpful, and I was looking forward to coming today, even though I knew it would make me want to cry. Mm. Um, I think the thing that I'm still struggling with is how we lead staff into revisiting this having this conversation, processing what most of them have not either had time to or chosen to process without re-traumatizing them. Mm. And I think I still don't quite know how to do that, but I feel like this conversation today has touched on pieces, so I was just curious if you could like speak a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, here and then here. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Um, first of all, ever true. Um, and I think um, for me, I want to take it back to one of the first things that you said about the communication element. And I'm a public health communicator, and I actually work at an independent boarding school, so bringing the kids back to on-campus in-person instruction was really important for lots of reasons, not including the business model. Um, but I also know that there are some groups in our society that do a really great job of communicating and others that do not. And how we frame an issue, how we brand an issue, how we talk about these things really makes a difference. So the whole is issue of physical distance versus social distance was huge and it gets to the issues of loneliness and all of these other things. So I really, really appreciated that. Um, but I also know that, and I just wrote my dissertation on this, you know, the issue of collectivism versus individualism was a major element that contributes or is part of the conversation about the politics. Um, and when we look across the world at those countries that were or have collectivist societies, we know that they all did infinitely better, and that goes back to what the public health nurses over there were saying. So for me, I think there's sort of two issues. One, at our core, as Americans, we're selfish people. Um, and I think um, when we think about how we use language and words and images um, across the board, we did a horrible job in this country compared to others. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Karen Bischoff. I am a person with long COVID and the founder and president of the COVID-19 Long Hauler Advocacy Project. And I was infected with COVID back in March 2020 while working as a firefighter paramedic, essential mm. worker. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk more about um, and ask a question related to, you know, 20 million people in the U.S. is the bottom line number of people who may have long COVID. There was also just a study for pediatrics that was redacted that said there was only 1 million, children, 1 million kids with long COVID in the U.S. It's actually 6 million. So how do we reconcile with the fact that there is this pressure to move on, there is this stigmatization, this politicization, but even now we're still see seeing over a thousand people dying a week from COVID, we're still seeing 20% develop long COVID with that number increasing with every reinfection. How do we as public health officials deal with the trauma related to the pandemic while still encouraging people to take the right precautions and realize that we are probably going to be in this in an endemic state, but there are serious long-term consequences to developing COVID and developing many more health conditions. Thank you. How about if I take the first and the second and I leave you with the how-to at the end. So on, on the first question about um, you know, having these conversations without re-traumatizing your staff and the community, I, you know, I, I take that seriously. And um, you know, you, you, I don't know, you, you don't, maybe you don't want to take my word for it. Maybe check this out for yourself because you've all been exposed to a little bit of the characters. But honestly, like the, the main reason for me to do the character studies was to provide a more accessible way of tapping into some experiences um, that are humanizing. And this is gonna sound really weird, and I don't know that we hit this note in our conversation today, but in many of the characters' stories, there's something that's incredibly uplifting. And um, the, 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 you know, for those of you who wanna get a dose of this uh, book content without you know, getting the book itself, which I think is a terrible thing to do, by the way. You should definitely get the, the whole book, a couple of them. It's a great holiday gift. Um, 
I, I, one of the characters is um, profiled in New York Magazine, uh, and we haven't talked about her. Her name's Nula O'Doherty. And Nula's an amazing story because in the chat, title for the chapter about Nula is The Bridge. And Nula, I'm going to tell her story really, really fast. She was a career uh, district attorney who retired just before 2020. Irish immigrant family, married an Ecuadorian guy, bought a home in Jackson Heights, Queens. Anyone here know Jackson Heights? Maybe, maybe the most diverse neighborhood, not just in the United States, but in the world. Um, and you know, full of immigrants, crowded, dense. And she knew that people were going to get sick and were going to struggle from being cut out of the economy when things closed down. So she put out this sign that said, if you need help, call me, early in the pandemic. And scores of people called right away. And she was overwhelmed. So she put another call out and said, if you can give help, call me. Hmm. And even more people responded. And Nula did something, another thing we haven't talked about that's so important to the story of 2020. Nula and her neighbors started something called the COVID Care Neighborhood Network, which is an example of, for me, one of the best things that happened in this country in 2020, mutual aid network. And this is going to speak to the question about individualism versus collectivism, because it's true. The US is very individualistic in a lot of ways. But as individualistic as we are, and this is, you would learn this in Sociology 101, we also have this amazing tradition of collectivism and volunteerism, right, and civic engagement. It's the thing that Tocqueville was so stunned by, that the story of our habits of the heart. And Americans in every neighborhood of every city came together and joined these mutual aid networks. In Jackson Heights, they wound up getting thousands of people involved on the giving and receiving end for food, for pharmaceuticals, for cleaning supplies, for in-person services, for help setting up vaccinations. That it's just an extraordinary work that completely helped this community get through. And it's not unique. People did this all over. And, and just when the magazine article was coming out, people in New York Magazine said, before you we publish this, could you reach out to Nula and find out what she's doing now? And I'll tell you, the basement of Nula's house, which was the operations center for COVID Care Neighborhood Network, last year reopened with the same set of people as the Jackson Heights Immigration Center. Because they've just pivoted, and what they've done is they've found like there's a, a network of people who came together around COVID, did something extraordinary, got to know each other, and are, you know, are, are now dealing with the next, it's not the next pandemic, but it's in some ways the next real challenge for New York City. And I guarantee you that wherever you live, people who got together and worked on the pandemic are doing that thing now. And then really briefly on the individualism and collectivism thing, that's a hint of the collectivism that we're capable of. But note also that an individualistic society was not doomed to a catastrophic 2020. And we know this because, as I told you before, Australia is also one of the most individualistic societies in all of those world value surveys that we do. And it had so many structural similarities to the US when the pandemic began. But instead of like collective dysfunction, they got together a, like a, a special group of the, the, the leaders of every state in Australia, the political leaders with the health minister from every state, the, Scott Morrison, the right-wing prime minister, said, like, let's just be reasonable about this and, and not dysfunctional. And they wound up like, subsidizing the production of masks and distribution. They did testing and tracing when they could. They closed down the borders. They did targeted shutdowns. If the United States had the same mortality level from COVID as Australia, 900,000 Americans would still be alive today. 900,000. And that's, let me tell you, Australia is as individualistic as they come. So it's true. That was something we had to deal with. But it, we, we didn't have to be as dysfunctionally hyper-individualistic and chaotic as we became. And it's why we shouldn't give up. And it's why I still believe, as much as we messed up 2020, and as tough as these next few weeks are gonna be, we are still capable of getting this right. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And thank you for um, bringing us home on a positive note. I wanna, uh, just on the note of health communication, um, 
and, and the note on, on, on long COVID. One of the hard parts about communicating in the, it, it, the, the, the heat of the pandemic was we were more focused on not providing ammunition to this sort of like opposition than we were on being radically transparent, which is the essence of science. And I think the, the tough part about communicating science is it's a place where you need to marry transparency and fact with narrative and story. And I think we forget one side or the other. Folks are too bought in on the narrative or they're too bought in on like, let me just give you facts without giving you context or a way to understand it or scaffold it. And I think bringing those two things together is the essence of how we ought to talk about it. And it's a fundamental skill all of us need to have. There's not just a core of public health communicators, everybody at every level who is talking about this work has to be thinking about that. On that note, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a talk specifically on this at 10.30 tomorrow on the um, ignition stage in the, in the hall, specifically about like confidence when you're talking about science. Um, but I think really practicing those skills, Thanksgiving is gonna offer a great opportunity for many of us. <laughs> Building those skills is really fundamental. And when it comes to long COVID, I worry that because we're not willing to go back and plumb the depths of what has happened, we are also unwilling to, also, to talk about the persistent risks of COVID-19. It's not gone, it's mm. not going to be gone. There are persistent and real risks and it's important that people can make the best decision based on the best evidence. Not COVID is over, right? Which is kind of where the narrative is now, right? Not COVID is ever present for everybody all the time and, and it's the same risk as 2020, 21, but that there is a real risk and that some people infected with COVID may end up living with long COVID and those symptoms are real and they are uh, potentially devastating. And this is a fact and we know it. And I think part of it is also being able to engage in the narrative as the narrative is headed to be able to engage it and move it in a direction that is more productive and also more true. Um, and then the last note I'll say is I really appreciate you bringing us home on this point of mutual aid. Like the, the thing about it is my family is from Egypt and I spent a lot of my summers back in Egypt. And it is a much more collectivist society than, than, than we are here, that is true. But I will say that the neighborliness and the will to invest in other people when they need help is a real, true American ideal. Not everybody practices it, right? But it is an ideal, and I think we have to appeal to that. So with that, thank you so much for being here. Can we get one round of applause, one more round of applause for our guest, Professor Kleinenberg? Uh, and uh, in case I didn't say it enough, everybody just make sure that you and everybody you know goes out and votes, okay? Um, <laughs> because we got a big one coming next Tuesday. Thank you so much. That's our show. Thank you so much to Professor Eric Kleinenberg for joining us. And if you have guest recommendations for the show, share them with us at info at incisionmedia.com. And if you love the show, please do, please do drop us a like right here and subscribe. Half of you out there aren't subscribed yet, don't even know what you're doing. And if you want me in your headphones, America Dissected is also a podcast. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow me at Abdul El Sayed, no dash, on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And to check out more of our content and subscribe to our newsletter, head on over to incisionmedia.com. Links to our sponsors are available right here in the show notes. I really do hope that you'll check them out and show them some love. They make the show possible every single week.